Okay, well, thank you everyone. Uh, hello, and uh, uh, thank you for attending this talk. Um, as Lucas said, my name is Bob Stiegel, and I was invited by Klaus to speak to MOOC++ today about debugging techniques. This is an introductory talk, and it's aimed towards newcomers, newcomers and those with perhaps less C++ experience. What I hope to achieve here is to provide a uh, basic set of debugging tips and tools and tricks uh, that you can immediately apply to your own daily work. Uh, for those of you who have more experience, uh, you've probably already seen or experienced or employed most of the things, if not all of the things that I'm going to talk about today. But hopefully there will be some small nugget of useful information for you here as well. And if there's something you think should be added that would be useful to newcomers that I've that I've not included, please let me know. Uh, I'll be giving the next revision of this talk in three weeks at CPPCon in Aurora. So, you know, help is appreciated. All right, so uh, let's get started with, uh, with software failures. I find when I give talks, I like to start out at the ground and build up, and so, uh, in understanding why we debug, I think perhaps it's useful to understand and really have some feeling for the scope of software failures and, and their cost to society. And that uh, then informs or uh, Im increases the importance in our minds, I think, of debugging and proper functioning of our code. So I want to speak briefly about some failures and some, some information that you may or may not be aware of. So in January of 2018, uh, a company named Tricentis, which builds and sells uh, tools for software testing, published a, a, a document called the Software Fail Watch. And in that document, it listed 606 significant software failures in calendar year 2017. In the list, it estimated that these failures affected 3.6 billion people worldwide and we're responsible for almost $2 trillion of lost revenue. The software failures that they cataloged in total resulted in 268 years of downtime across the various industries, and that the number of failures that they found in 2017 was actually 10% higher than it was in 2016. Interestingly enough, uh, retail and consumer technology industries were the industries that experienced the most failures of all the industry groups that were analyzed. I'm not exactly sure, although I can guess, uh, these are highly competitive industries with fast development cycles and low margins. And typically in those kind of industries, software development is considered to be a cost center rather than a revenue or profit center. In May 2020, Undo Software and Judge Business and a MBA project done at the Judge Business School in Cambridge found that reproducing and fixing a failure on average takes about 13 hours of developer time, which is, you know, if you think about it, that's a little more than, a, than the average day and a half. More than a quarter of developer time is actually spent trying to reproduce failures and fix them. And in total, they estimated that this accounted for about 620 million developer hours every year, uh, corresponding to about $61 billion in, in salary, and a little over a trillion dollars in lost value, value that's lost to shareholders of these companies. So clearly, from a, from a very high-level perspective, the costs of software failures are quite large. But we can also look at some individual cases. And these are cases that I've covered before if you've seen some of my other talks, but I'd like to talk about them again briefly. The first is the Therac 25. The Therac 25 was a radiation therapy machine that was produced and sold by Atomic Energy of Canada. And from 1985 through 1987, it was involved in six accidents uh, with three deaths. And due to a number of design flaws, it could accidentally give patients radiation doses, doses of x-rays, that were hundred times great, hundreds of times greater than normal. There were a number of errors. Some were concurrent programming errors in race conditions. Uh, also, 
there was a global flag variable that was set by incrementing it. And occasionally it would overflow because it was a relatively low precision number and wrap around to zero. And when it wrapped around to zero, the software bypassed safety checks. There were other failures cited in the report, but from what I can tell, these were the two major, uh, two of the most important defects. Uh, in 1996, in June of 96, the Ariane 5 uh, basically broke up or exploded 37 seconds after its launch. And the problem was that there was a data conversion error. There was a 64-bit floating point number, a double, that represented a certain flight parameter, and it was being forced and converted to a 16-bit signed integer that was stored in a variable that represented something important to the, to the flight. Well, what happened 37 seconds into the flight was that the value being forced into, being cast from the double into the 16-bit signed integer exceeded the possible value of a 16-bit signed integer and caused a runtime processor trap because the floating point, point value was too large. This, of course, caused a cascading set of failures and the rocket became dis unstable, broke up, and exploded. Um, in September of 1999, the Mars Climate Orbiter uh, burned up in space at a cost of about $235 million to the American taxpayer. And this uh, is kind of famous in that it was caused by uh, a, an incorrect units conversion. So uh, computer software produced on one module produced output in non-SI units of pound four seconds and pass that value to something that was expecting the units to be in terms of the SI units of Newton seconds. So there was this huge disparity and it caused the flight to go out of control and uh, the orbiter burned up in Mars atmosphere. In August of 2012, uh, Knight Capital, a, a program trading firm, uh, lost $460 million in 45 minutes. And what happened here was that a repurposed flag was left enabled and that flag activated dead code used for testing trading algorithms. And what happened is the dead code was activated and began rapidly executing almost random trades, which ended up moving prices higher and lower. It triggered 4 million order executions in 45 minutes and it ended up disrupting the prices of 154 stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, I believe they ended up going out of business after this. And of course, most recently, there was the Boeing 737 MAX tragedies. So in October of 2018 and March of 2019, the two Boeing 737 MAX jets crashed, killing a total of 346 people. Now, Boeing relied on a system called the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. There's a very good article in the uh, April 2019 edition of IEEE Spectrum, and in that article, a pilot named Gregory Travis describes in layman's terms the systems that failed. There's an awful lot of information in that article, but he summarizes the failure in three points. First, Boeing produced an airframe that was, that was dynamically unstable. It then attempted to mask uh, that instability with a software system which in real time would correct the unstable aspects of the airframe in flight. And finally, the software that did this correction relied on hardware systems that were known for their propensity to fail. These are the angle of attack indicators. And the software did not include even any sort of rudimentary provisions to cross check the outputs of the angle of attack sensor against the other sensors in the airports or even the other angle of attack sensor, the backup. So this was an awful tragedy, and uh, these are the kind of things that, that, in a sense, give our industry a black eye and are definitely the kind of things that we want to avoid. And so part of that is writing high-quality software that doesn't contain defects or bugs. So all of that being said, what can we do? Well, here's what I'd like to talk about today in this short presentation. First of all, I'd like to provide sort of a basic definition of what defects or 
what we commonly call bugs are. I'd then like to talk a little bit about what debugging itself is and what it entails. I'll then cover some of the challenges that we encounter when we try to debug problems. Most of the talk will be spent discussing what I like to think of as being a process for debugging. It's, it's relatively simple, and it's, approach, it's an approach that I've used for many years, uh, 31 years now, that seems to work well most of the time. It's not perfect by any means, but uh, I suspect it's very similar to what many other experienced C++ programmers do. And hopefully it will be helpful to those of you who are newcomers or are perhaps less experienced. Finally, I'd like to end with some recommendations based on my experiences in the past and also uh, how to use the process. So all that being said, I will warn you right now, there are some opinions here. And since I'm the guy in front of the camera, I'm going to assume that my opinion is the correct one, you know, at least for the next few minutes. So let's move on. So what are defects? If you've seen any of my talks, you know that I like to start out by defining things, defining terms in a clear and concise way so that I can build on those definitions and hopefully provide meaningful information later on in the presentation. And this talk is no different. So let's talk about what defects are to begin. So one common view uh, and is that a defect or a bug is an error in a computer program that causes it to produce incorrect or unexpected results or exhibit unintended behavior. Uh, people like to use the term bug popularly. We also call them uh, errors or problems or defects. Uh, but the important thing is that there's some flaw in the code, in the system, that is causing the system to behave in a way that is not correct or that we think is not correct. Oh, I come from a long history, perhaps uh, about 17 years spent in the in medical industry, uh, medical imaging industry, both as a as a research assistant, uh, later running a medical imaging company, and then after that being the so director of software engineering for a medical imaging startup. And I think about it in all of those jobs, uh, there's a tendency to think about things in terms of quality systems. And if you work in a regulated industry, you're probably familiar with this term and what a quality system is. And I think that's actually a very useful perspective and way of thinking about defects. So every software system is subject to a set of requirements that describe things like its operating environment, uh, the acceptable inputs, how it's supposed to be used, its interactions with the outside world, its acceptable outputs, and its expected behavior while it's executing. Now, these requirements are not always explicitly stated, but they're always present. I would guess probably in most systems, the set of requirements that govern the product are probably implicit. Uh, you know, we just sort of working on the project know what the requirements are. Uh, however, in regulated industries like, say, medical imaging or creating medical devices, uh, nuclear energy, aerospace, automotive, uh, transportation, uh, generally you're required to actually explicitly state your requirements and be able to demonstrate that you have tested your product against those requirements and that your product fulfills all of those requirements. And that is sort of a bare minimum requirement before your product can be allowed on the market. So keeping that in mind, a software, a software defect uh, is then, can then be thought of as a non-conformity to requirements. And this is language that's used in various quality systems like ISO 9001 or ISO 13485 or IEC 62384. They think of defects as being non-conformities to requirements. And what this really means is that uh, the product is failing to fulfill some subset of the system's requirements. That subset of requirements is being violated, and thus there's a nonconformity. 
And as I mentioned before, this viewpoint, this way of thinking about defects is very common in regulated industries. Now, a defect doesn't always need to be uh, incorrect functioning. Sometimes defects refer to inefficiencies or uh, unmet expectations that are not necessarily incorrect, but for which the requirements might be ambiguous or unstated. All right, so keeping that in mind, what then is debugging? Well, the wellspring of all knowledge, Wikipedia, has a very nice definition, I think, and it says debugging is the process of finding and resolving bugs, uh, parenthetically defects or problems that prevent correct operation within computer programs, software, or systems. So I think this is a pretty reasonable definition and would correspond to what most professional programmers think of debugging as entailing. But if you look at the definition, uh, there are some sort of underlying assumptions here in the definition and, and things that I want to call out because they're important in the debugging process. So the first assumption is that we actually understand what correct operation means. In other words, how do we really know that some behavior exhibit, exhibited by the system is actually wrong? Sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, and it can be very difficult sometimes if you have uh, a producer of a product and a consumer of that product, and the producer and the consumer have differing expectations on what the requirements are, assuming that we're working here from implicit requirements and they've not both explicitly agreed on what correct behavior is. So sometimes we don't always know that something is wrong. There's also an underlying assumption that we have the ability to observe the program's behavior and their output so that we as programmers or engineers can decide for ourselves whether or not the reported behavior is actually corresponds to an error or a defect. There's an underlying assumption that we have the ability to change the underlying source code and other supporting data that are part of the program or the system. And there's an assumption that we somehow have the ability to build and test those updated programs. So this is probably obvious, but sometimes I find it useful to state the obvious as it helps conversation downstream. The next thing I'd like to do is just briefly go over some terminology. And I know terminology is boring, but I think it's helpful in that it can make conversations and discussions about issues much easier. And so let's start with nonconformity. Well, a nonconformity is a failure to meet requirements, whether they are implicit or explicitly stated. A defect, a defect, also called bug, error, or program, is incorrect program data. And by program data, I mean all of the things that go into a program's creation and execution. The code, the input, the settings uh, that configure it, dependencies, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things, uh, incorrect program data that causes a nonconformity. A symptom, which I will use the term I'll use quite frequently, is an observ is observable evidence of a defect. Now it's important to distinguish symptoms from defects. It's actually very rare for a symptom to be the defect itself. A deterministic defect is one that doesn't change its symptoms under a well-defined set of conditions. Given the same input and the same conditions, you can run the program or the system over and over again, and every time you will observe exactly the same behavior. This is nice when you can have it. In contrast, a non-deterministic defect is a, def a defect that changes its symptoms from run to run under a, a well-defined set of conditions. And these are the cases that nobody likes to debug because you, you have the same input, you run the same thing over and over again, but you get different symptoms or different failures, or sometimes you don't fail. Uh, sometimes these non-deterministic defects are playfully called Heisenbugs, which is a pun on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle named after German physicist Werner Heisenberg. And of course, there is the corollary name, Bohrbug, named after the Danish physicist Niels Bohr, and that's a play on his original deterministic model of atoms. So a deterministic defect is sometimes referred to as a Bohr bug, and a non-deterministic defect is sometimes referred to as an Eisen bug. And I'm sure physicists out there appreciate and enjoy this kind of strange humor.
So context is another term I use frequently. And I'm using the word context to mean the totality of the environment in which a program that exhibits symptoms is running. This is everything that contributes to the execution of the program, the code, the data, the output, the systems and interfaces it's speaking with uh, while it's running. I will call an analogous context a context that replicates enough of the original context sufficiently to reproduce a set of symptoms. The lab is a setting in which you have total control over the context, like your PC or workstation or the servers that you do your development work on. The field is a setting where you have minimal or no control over the context. And this would correspond to, you know, the test environment that your test team owns, they don't let you touch, or products that have been deployed and they're out in the field with customers. But basically it's a situation where you, as an engineer, don't control the context. It's out in the wild, so to speak. Problem report is something that describes one or more symptoms. And I'm going to assume that for the rest of this talk that a problem report is legitimate. So the problem report describes one or more symptoms and each symptom is caused by one or more defects. And the evidence of a defect is made observable by its system, uh, symptoms. So we sort of have this one to many to many relationship. One problem report can manifest or, or report multiple symptoms and each symptom can be responsible, can be created by multiple defects, and each defect can have multiple systems, uh, symptoms. Sorry. Okay. So when we're trying to debug systems, there are a number of challenges that we face. Uh, for those of you who end up having to support reports that come in from customers, problem reports can be, and I'll say generously here, unhelpful. They can contain misleading or inadequate or incorrect descriptions of symptoms. And generally they reflect a lack of knowledge on the user's part about the product, things like the version number, the configuration, the platform, stuff that describes the context. Another challenge is that the problem reports we receive may not indicate actual problems. Sometimes the behavior that the customer thinks is uninspected or, or incorrect is actually not a defect. And that's kind of nice, at least as an engineer, when that happens, because you can throw the ball back in somebody else's court. But it also, in some sense, reflects a failure of communication uh, on the part of uh, the producer to the consumer. Collecting program state data can be difficult, uh, data that describes the context. Uh, the logs, the setting, configuration information, crash dumps, core files, these could be incomplete, they could be inconclusive, they could be unavailable, they could be non-existent. And I've experienced all of these things. The symptoms will very likely probably not indicate the cause. In any, it's been my experience at least, in any large, non-trivial, complex system, that the cause and effect are typically distant in time and space. And in space, what I mean is they're distant in terms of numbers of lines of code apart from each other. And in time, I mean the time at which a defect occurs relative to the time at which a symptom is made manifest and observed. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense for complex systems. The defects and the symptoms may be correlated. And by this, what I mean is sometimes as you're in the midst of a repair, the symptoms will change and you need to reevaluate what you've done. Perhaps by fixing some portion, the symptoms of change, which reflect some portion or some defect that was latent that you weren't aware of that require you to reevaluate what you're doing. Of course, the thing we all hope to avoid is that when fixing one defect introduces new defects into the system. And this is typically uh, indicative of quick fixes or, well, messy design. And probably the worst thing 
is that symptoms are typically difficult to reproduce, especially for complex systems. Debugging in the field is not always possible. Constructing an analogous context in the lab is not always possible or feasible. As I mentioned before, program state data is not always available. And symptoms from non-deterministic defects can be especially challenging. In this case, when I talk about non-deterministic, I'm thinking really of those cases where we are working on or trying to debug multi-threaded code and we have race conditions, or in complex multi-component systems where there's complex connections and state with the outside world, and the input that comes from the outside world into that system is, in a sense, random or hard to predict. All of these things can make symptoms difficult to reproduce. So let's talk about my simple debugging process. And let's start with it in theory. We want to be able to characterize and reproduce a problem. And this means determining the surrounding context and observing incorrect behavior for ourselves. We want to locate the problem. That is, we want to find the lines in code that are responsible for the defect. We want to classify the problem, meaning we want to understand what kind of defect it is that we've encountered and that we're attempting to fix. We want to understand the problem. And by this, I mean we want to determine the root cause of the defect and its relationship to the system as a whole. And finally, we want to repair the defect, meaning we want to resolve it such that we don't break anything else and that the, uh, and that the unexpected or incorrect behavior no longer exists. We tend to think of debugging as being a simple linear process. At least that's the way it's presented in a lot of introductory articles and how-tos. And if I had to write that simple process out in code, it would look something like this. It's my job to debug some version of a product given some issue and return a better version of that product. So I'll characterize and reproduce the problem. I'll locate it. I'll classify it. I'll do my best to understand it. I'll create a new version that is repaired and presumably has fixed the problem. And then I'll throw it over the fence and return it to somebody else so they can make sure it gets deployed. That's the theory, but life is not always as easy as theories. At first glance, the process appears to make sense. However, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, while in practice there is. This is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it actually was in the Yale Literary Magazine in 1882, and it's famously been misattributed to people like Yogi Berra, the baseball star, Albert Einstein, Richard Feynman, Walter Savage, and many others. And in my mind, there's actually an analogy here with software engineering processes. And this may be familiar to you, those of you who work in in settings where there are defined software processes. The, what I just presented to you is, in my mind, analogous to the waterfall process. It's a perfectly valid process for simple, small cases where there's a lot of understanding and a lot of low, not much risk. But in the real world, or in larger or more complex problems, you need a different process. You need a better process one that scales up, uh, one that is cognizant of the realities of working in the real world. And here in this uh, diagram that I provided, this is an image that I've used in other talks, which is uh, a depiction of the rational unified process, or RUP. This is an example of an iterative and incremental process that attempts to ad address high-risk development issues first and weights activities according to the phase of the project. It's iterative and incremental, and I've actually used this process uh, in the companies that I ran that were doing medical imaging. I think it's a great process. It can scale up or down, and if you're interested, I highly recommend looking it up. Again, it's the Rational Unified Process, or RUP, R-U-P. However, getting back to a code-based depiction of the process, in practice, if I had to write my process as a function, it would look a little different than the function I just showed you. So my job would be to debug a product where an issue has been reported. 
And so the first thing I would do is I would review the problem report and try to understand exactly what the problem is uh, and if there is or is not a defect. I then try to characterize and reproduce the problem with that version of the product, either that binary build or that source build. I would try to reproduce the problem with the artifacts, the actual artifacts and context that were being used by the person, uh, by the entity that, that reported the problem. Assuming I could do that, the next thing I would do would be to clone the product, clone the artifacts, create a new repo, make a new branch, however you do it, and then try to reproduce the problem in that clone of the product. So assuming that I can reproduce the problem, and assuming that management has decided that, yes, we'll give you resources to fix this problem. And what I would do is basically try to understand the problem, try to locate the problem, and try to classify the problem all at the same time. You know, it's been my experience that these things, even though they are not quite orthogonal, they are intertwined enough that you actually are doing all of these simultaneously anyway. So I'm, you know, jokingly representing them here as using async as though they're running in different processes. And so what I'll do is I'll wait until I've gained some insight and I think I know the location and the category of the problem. And then I will attempt to repair the problem. And I will go through this cycle either until I cannot reproduce the problem, meaning it's been fixed, or management has decided you've done enough, ship something, and I drop out of the loop. So if the problem is fixed, then I will deliver the product and, uh, you know, report a positive outcome. Otherwise, you know, maybe I'll update my resume and report a negative outcome. It depends on the company. So, Let's look at characterizing and reproducing the problem, uh, the, the, the cornerstone of the process. So by characterizing uh, the problem, what I mean is determining the context in which the symptoms were observed. And again, this is things like the version number of the artifacts, the platform it was running on, the resources that were allocated like disk space or memory, external interfaces, you know, network interfaces, hardware interfaces, configuration data, all of the things that contribute to the, the runtime environment in which the product is running. And the goal is to gather enough information to allow me to instantiate an analogous context. In other words, a context that has enough of that information that I can reproduce the problem. It doesn't have to be everything. It just has to be enough to reproduce the problem. In reproducing the problem, I want to be able to actually instantiate that analogous context, preferably in my lab where I have total control, but if not, in the field. And hopefully there's someone in the field with whom I can cooperate who will help me uh, in the debugging process. I need to be able to run enough of the program or execute enough of the system to observe the reported symptoms. I don't need to do everything. I just need to be able to get to the point to where I've seen the symptoms. And then I think it's important at this point to start thinking about and or developing new or, ex or updating existing test assets or test cases that demonstrate that failure, right? Uh, presumably, if it's a customer reporting this, it's never been seen in your test cases. And so you need to be able to test against this at some point. And so you'll need to start developing those test assets. And this is probably the, the point in the process where you wanna start thinking about developing those assets. And as a quick tip, make sure you're looking at the at the correct source code. Uh, I once worked with I once had two colleagues. I'll call them uh, Alice and Bill. And Bill decided that there was a bug in some code that Alice had written. So Bill started commenting out Alice's code, and he could the bug kept occurring. Bill was sure that the problem was in Alice's code, and at the end he commented out all of Alice's code, and the bug still occurred. So he went to Alice and said, Alice, 
I've commented on all of your code and I've determined that your code does nothing, which of course is an absurd statement. And Alice went back and looked at Bill's screen and in one X term, uh, Bill was working in one repo where he was editing and changing and compiling code and he was executing the code from a, a, a different repo where he'd already built the program. So I guess the moral of the story is, make sure you're looking at the correct source code and you're building from that source code. So I wanna reemphasize that characterizing and reproducing a problem is absolutely vital to the debugging process. It is incredibly difficult to fix a problem if you can't reproduce it uh, in the lab. Uh, it is incredibly frustrating and time consuming and I've had to do that a couple times in my career, and it, those have not been happy experiences. So let's look at the next part of the process, which is understanding, locating, and classifying the problems. And even though these are intended to be uh, concurrent while you're working on this, concurrent in your brain, I'm going to go through them in the order that I have them listed here because, you know, we're humans and time is serial for us. So let's talk about understanding the problem. Understanding means gaining enough knowledge about the problem and the surrounding code such that you think you can make changes that, that will carry out a repair. And so in my mind, at a minimum, you should have located the correct, incorrect lines of code. You should have determined why the code is incorrect. In other words, you know what is the root cause you have determined a proposed classification. You think you know what kind of problem this is. You have formulated a set of proposed changes. You've determined how your proposed changes would affect the runtime state of the program. And you've determined if your proposed changes would correct the problem. Now, of course, in some sense, this is all executing in the compiler and the runtime system in your brain. So, it may turn out that later you find that you're wrong. But when you think you understand the problem, you know, you've fulfilled these cr criteria and you're ready to move on. So I find it helpful starting out to inspect and verify the associated test assets. Uh, in addition to existing test assets, which may have missed the problem, there are the new test assets I mentioned you should start working on. Uh, it could be that the test cases or test harnesses themselves are broken. Perhaps they're not testing correctly or they missed a test. Uh, also, there are cases where you test against known set of test data and you should review the test data and make sure there are not problems with that. When you're trying to understand the defect and locate it, you're going to find that it may not be where you expect it, especially in the non-deterministic case. And try to keep an open mind and be ready to question all parts of the program. Uh, because, especially in the non-deterministic case, it's been my experience that the, 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 the location of the defect is almost always not where I initially thought it was. When you're trying to locate the defect, ask yourself where the defect is not. See if that you can prove to yourself that there are some regions of the program where the defect absolutely cannot be. And sometimes trying to prove the absence of a defect in a given location can actually re reveal that defect to you. Another helpful technique is to explain to yourself out loud or explain to somebody else, another member of your team, why there is a defect where the defect is, and why you think your proposed fix will resolve the defect. And if there's a member of your team who has more experience, you know, the local guru, and they're willing and patient, they could be a huge help in helping you work through the problem. So once you understand the problem, you want to try to locate it. So, of course, this may be a case of, you know, closing the barn door after the horse has left, but I think it's important to employ good development practices from the very outset. Uh, practice iterative incremental bottom-up development. Add functionality in small sections of code. Create test assets for new, each new increment of functionality. Verify that your new code doesn't cause previous test cases to fail. You know, golden rule number one, thou shalt not introduce regressions. Verify that new code passes its own test cases. 
and practice defensive programming. Um, you know, this style of bottom-up development maximizes the benefit of incremental development. You know, once a piece of code has been successfully added, it's likely that its behavior is not going to change when you add more code to it incrementally. In other words, existing code probably will not rely on the parts that you're going to add to it later. And so if an error occurs, it, it makes it more likely that the error is in the piece that you've just added. Unless, of course, the old parts weren't tested well. So just in general, I and many others find that it's much easier to find defects in modular, well-designed code that has well-written, well-thought-out, and extensive test assets, test cases, input test data, etc. Preferably, the entire product does this from, from its inception, but if it doesn't, if you're handed somebody else's spaghetti code, that a minimum, your fixes should try to follow this set of practices. So another technique you can use in trying to locate the problem is trace logging. This is the thing, of course, you learn about in your first computer science class or when you first start programming. You generate output in the program that describes the, the state of the program during execution. And in simpler cases, smaller programs, it can be perfectly adequate to instrument your code with print, print statements, you know, writing to printf or cout. In more complex systems, it's very likely that there's a logging system that's integrated into the system. And so you can use the logging system to effectively do trace logging, perhaps by turning up the debug or output level and then inserting your own logging statements so that you can follow program flow in hopes of, of, of locating the bug. I think when you're developing new code, trace logging is a great way to stay on the narrow path. It's, it's a great way to help you make sure that, yes, the new code that you're writing is actually doing what you think it's doing. And as I said, it's usually an easy first step in narrowing down a problem scope for smaller problems, smaller programs. Sometimes even with larger programs, it can be effective, although in the case of larger, more complex systems, it's not my first choice. Now, one thing to keep aware of is that it adds runtime overhead. And this runtime overhead can hinder the search when you're looking for non-deterministic problems or race conditions. Sometimes merely the act of writing something to see out or stood out is enough to consistently change the timing of a program that the race condition no longer occurs. Another perfectly valid option and one that I use all the time is to use your debugger and any available analysis tools. Your C++ compiler is actually pretty smart, and it can give you lots of knowledge, but only if you let it. And the way you get this knowledge is to turn on the warnings. I enable almost all warnings for everything that I build these days because I've bitten too many times by not listening to them in the past. You can also use static code analysis tools like Coverity or CPP Check, which can do a deeper analysis uh, of your code looking for, for defects uh, they can't necessarily duplicate runtime, but they can look for things like undefined behavior, which could result in race conditions uh, at runtime. Interactive debuggers, GDB, LLDB, the built-in debugger in Visual Studio, Undo's UDB, uh, there are others, TotalView, I think. Uh, these are all great products I use Currently, my work is very Linux-centric, and in fact, this talk is in a sense Linux and Unix-centric. I use GDB in TUI mode all the time. I think it's a great tool. Uh, it's very useful. There are also so-called time travel debuggers, and I don't have much experience with them, but these are basically debuggers that capture the history of a program while it executes and can allow you to step backwards through time from a given breakpoint in order to determine program state just before a failure. There are also things like sanitizers, which, uh, you know, address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, undefined behavior sanitizer. These are things that you link in, uh, that include libraries that you link in with your code and flags that you set your compiler. And what it does is it instruments your code. It provides lightweight instrumentation to track the execution of your program looking for things like uh, 
bad writes to pointers, race conditions and threads, or undefined behavior. There are also the so-called dynamic program analyzers like Valgrind or Callgrind or Hellgrind. And these are things which, in a sense, implement virtual machines, virtual environments in which your program runs. And it watches everything that your program does in that environment in an attempt to find uh, invalid behavior or bad behavior and report it to you. Of course, the downside here is that the execution is, is much slower and uh, they're not always as good for finding race conditions as you might hope they would be. You also have things like call tracers and domain-specific diagnostic tools. S-Trace on Unix systems uh, for tracing uh, calls to the operating system. Or you can have tools like Wireshark or TCP dump uh, for debugging your program's output, uh, uh, networking output, or SQL analyzers uh, if you're you know, writing queries to a SQL database. You know, there are all kinds of tools which you can employ, which are, in a sense, outside the domain of C++, but can hook into your program and give you useful information about how it's executing. So all of these tools I've found to be very powerful tools and useful for the case where problems are deterministic. However, they're not always so useful for non-deterministic problems, especially if runtime overhead is added by the tool. For example, in interactive debuggers, you typically have to compile with some level of debugging information. Sanitizers instrument the code by adding uh, in, you know, calls to instrumentation. All of these things add overhead. And in the case of race conditions, sometimes that overhead is enough to affect the program state and make the race condition go away. So very powerful for deterministic problems and sometimes very powerful for non-deterministic problems, but not always. You should enable or add assertions. And for those of you that don't know, an assertion is a facility that evaluates some Boolean expression, some predicate at runtime, and it causes a serious error to occur if that predicate is false. And typically, if you use the assert facility that's part of the C standard library, it causes a program termination. You can also create your own asserts, uh, which throw C++ exceptions that you catch at some higher uh, stack frame and, and record the appropriate information. But in any event, when an assertion fires, when the predicate is false, some non-trivial program behavior occurs that clearly and convincingly demonstrates, yes, there's a problem. There's a problem when I fired. I think it and I like to use assertions to verify preconditions and postconditions before and after calling a function to make sure that the data the function getting is what I think it should be and that the function is returning the result I think it should return. I like assertions are great for verifying class invariance. When I have more complex types, I will typically write a self-test member function. And in that self-test member function, I will go through and use assertions to validate that all the invariants I think should hold in that class are in fact holding in that instance of that class. They can be used to just verify expected program state at, uh, at arbitrary points in the execution of the program. So the nice thing about assertions is they typically have very little effect. They have some effect, but they have small effect on execution speed because typically you're evaluating uh, a Boolean expression, which is hopefully a simple expression, and then inside the if statement, you're then following the slow code path of figuring out what the error is and reporting it. These are a great tool for both deterministic and non-deterministic defects, mostly because of the low overhead. That being said, there is some runtime overhead that's added, although it tends to be small, and there's some code complexity that's added. I usually don't mind the code complexity. I think the additional code complexity is worth the cost of having the statements there that allow me to validate or verify that the program is doing what I expect it to do. Another technique is something called backtracking, where you start where you think the problem is, and you mentally step backward through the code. You use the, the mental compiler and the mental CPU in your brain, and you work your way backwards. You try to understand the state of the program at each step as you work backwards. 
and there's really not much more to it than that. This is a great technique for very simple programs or cases where you have small search areas and you have a deterministic problem. It's easy to do quickly and it's easy to use to form a first guess as to what the problem might be. However, it's considerably less effective when you have complex programs or large search areas. And by search area, I mean the distance in time and space from the location of the defect to where the symptom is manifesting. However, it's really, in my experience, almost useless for non-deterministic problems. And there are, there are better tools you can use in that case. A very powerful tool is what, what I call divide and conquer, others call binary search. And the technique should be obvious from the name. You pick a section of code that you're going to examine, and you place an assertion or a breakpoint halfway through the section. You run the code, and if the assertion fires or the breakpoint is reached and the program is in an, in an invalid state, then it's pretty good indication that the problem is in the first half. If not, if the assertion doesn't fire or the breakpoint is reached with no problems, then it's likely the problem's in the second half. And you repeat this process of having or, or successive refinement until you get a small enough section in code that it reveals the defect. Now, when you're using this technique, you can use trace logging in place of assertions or breakpoints. And I think I mentioned before, for deterministic problems where you have a large search area, this is really a very powerful technique and it's usually the first thing I reach for. It's not always effective for non-deterministic problems, but it can be if you approach if you approach the uh, if you if you approach the problem correctly and we'll get to that in a moment another technique is called program or problem simplification and basically we've all done this this is one of the debugging techniques they teach us in our first computer science class you gradually and strategically remove ie you comment out sections of irrelevant code and this is very powerful when you combine it with the divide and conquer approach. Another useful uh, corollary to this idea is working with input data. You can use this same technique for input data. If you think that your input data that you think is good is bad, you can use the same uh, technique of, con of continuously refining and having the amount of data that you examine until you find data that is problematic. When you combine problem simplification, commenting out code, with divide and conquer, it's very useful for debugging crashes of release builds because you can, uh, you can comment out the code, do a release build, you've not actually added any runtime overhead, and see if the crash occurs. It's also quite useful for non-deterministic problems. And in the case where you're, where you're using this technique of pro problem simplification, and you're going to divide the problem in half each time, what I strongly recommend is that you work backwards from the end of the section. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Things at the end of the section probably rely on things that come from the front of the section. So if you work backwards, you don't have any broken dependencies while the program is executing. So you would comment out the last half of the program. If, if the bug occurred in the first half of the section, then you would cut the first half of the section in half, commenting out the second quarter, and so on and so forth, until you work your way forward, whittling down uh, to a section where you can actually find uh, the problematic code. Another interesting and very powerful technique, especially in the case of non-deterministic problems, try to make the problem worse. Sometimes you have a non-deterministic problem and the symptom occurs very infrequently. And so it can be very hard to debug that problem. And so one technique for helping you debug that problem is figure out a way 
to cause the symptoms to occur more frequently, make the thing break more often. And I find that this, just figuring out what you need to do to make the non-deterministic case break uh, is actually can be quite helpful as a first step in figuring out where the problem is and what the problem is. And it's, as I said, very useful for non-deterministic problems, especially when the symptoms that you're, that you're trying to understand are infrequent. Another technique is the scientific method. And just like the name implies, you try to, you sort of try to approach this in a systematic way. You form a hypothesis about what the problem is that is consistent with the observations, the symptoms. Then you perhaps implement new tests or you refine existing tests to refute that hypothesis. You want to see if you can disprove it. If you can disprove your hypothesis, then that means your hypothesis was wrong and what you thought was the bug is not the bug. And so you formulate a new hypothesis and implement or refine tests to, dispu to disprove or refute your new hypothesis. And you repeat this until you come up with a hypothesis that cannot be refuted. And if you can't refute your hypothesis, then you've found the problem. This requires a lot of mental activity, a lot of active thinking about the problem. Now this technique I found when I use it uh, is effective for almost all problems. It's sort of a generic framework in, under which you can apply any of the things that I've just talked about. And it's good in that it forces you to really understand uh, how the code works and how program state evolves during execution. It's, as I said, it's compatible with all the other methods of location that I just described. They can all be used with this. The downside is that it can be very time consuming, especially for unfamiliar code bases. And if you're the, the new person on a project and, and your initiation, your hazing, so to speak, is to fix some terrible bug, uh, this can take a lot of time. However, if you want to understand that code, it can be well worth the time spent. If you're not so interested in understanding the code, then you know you can apply some of the other techniques in more of a brute force fashion, especially divide and conquer, and probably get good results. And finally, you know, probably be able to find the problem. So, looking at the problem differently, when you have deterministic, and this this slide is you know my experiences. If you have deterministic problems. You know, first thing you should always do, read the bug report, read the logs. Add assertions of one form or another, wherever you think they need to be, to verify that invariants hold, that preconditions are met, that postconditions are met. If possible, use an interactive debugger like GDB or LLDB or UDB, and use a divide and conquer method with breakpoints. If you can't do that, then add assertions, say you have to work with release code, then add assertions using a divide and conquer method. Now, because we think it's a deterministic problem, this can probably get you to the location of the problem pretty quickly. However, for non-deterministic problems, I tend to take a different approach once I think they're non-deterministic. Again, review the, the problem reports and the logs. And the first thing I'll do is create a debug build and see if the debug build exhibits the same symptoms as the release build. If the debug build never shows the same symptoms as the release build, then that says to me, at least in my experience, immediately, this is a race condition. Prepare for your life to be difficult for the next few hours. So again, add insertions where you need them to verify invariants add assertions, or use the simplification method using divide and conquer to see if the symptoms go away. And of course, if need be, try to make the problem worse. If it's an infrequently occurring set of symptoms, then try to figure out how to make them occur more frequently. If need be, try the low overhead debugging tools like sanitizers or 
uh, the static an uh, the runtime analyzers, and see if the if the um, non-deterministic problem occurs when using those tools. So the non-deterministic problem is similar to the deterministic problem. It's just been, at least in my case, in my experience, the non-deterministic problems are usually related to race conditions, and race conditions usually require debugging in release builds. Although sometimes you can build stuff like with GCC that's, uh, that has debugging information uh, in release builds, for example, if you're using minus G, minus O2 flags, and sometimes you can get enough useful information uh, in the debugger uh, to make it worthwhile. So let's talk about classifying the problem. Classifying or classification, in my mind, is determining the defect's overall category. And knowing what the category is can be useful information when you're formulating a repair strategy. Uh, it's also, I think, in any sort of well-disciplined engineering environment, critical information that you need to have in subsequent reviews when you're considering preventive actions. In other words, if I know that a race condition is occurring all the time in our code, what do I need to do to prevent this from occurring uh, in the future? Uh, so having and recording that information is vital to improving software quality over time. So the first kind of problem that we have is syntax errors. And syntax errors are those problems that, have, that occur when you have invalid source code. You violated the language's grammar in some way. And in C++, we're very lucky, unlike interpreted languages, uh, in that the compiler catches these and the issues errors immediately, you know, most of the time. Now, you can be working on the edge of a compiler's capabilities where valid code generates a compile error or a compile or uh, a compile error is not generated for invalid code. Those cases, in my experience, are quite rare. Now, even though the compiler catches these problems, it can be an issue in, multi, in the development of multi-platform products. In other words, a feature is added or a defect is fixed for a product on a given platform, tests are run, code is checked in through the develop branch or the main branch, goes off to automated testing, and guess what? The code fails on a different platform. I had this happen to me quite frequently at another company that I worked at where a developer I sat beside who was very senior uh, would work on problems, solve problems and defects in Linux and run, the, run all the tests and they would pass in Linux and would, uh, uh, would merge the code into the main branch and the tests would fail on FreeBSD. And of course, then it fell to me to go and fix the problems that his fixes introduced on FreeBSD so that the, the product would work on both platforms. So on single platform products, it's usually not a problem. You really, this is a problem in the development of multi-platform products. You also have syntax warnings, which indicate basic semantic errors. In other words, code that's syntactically code that is syntactically valid but questionable. And as we all know, in this case, the C++ compiler issues warnings. Uh, and warnings are things we, we should pay attention to. Things like narrowing conversions, um, undefined, I'm sorry, um, uninitialized variables, um, questionable undefined behavior that the compiler doesn't catch or that it issues a warning for. Um, Things that are not technically errors, but raise a flag and say, hey, you should look at this code and make sure you're actually doing what you intend to be doing. Uh, something like this might have actually caught the problem where the double was converted to the int 16 uh, for that rocket launch, the, uh, the Ariane 5. So we have also simple source code errors, what I think of as being syntactically correct typos. And these, in my mind, are especially evil because they permit you to create successful builds that have latent defects in them. And if you'll permit me a, a minute, I'd like to share with you one particularly silly problem that cost me an hour of my professional life some years ago. I was writing a parser, a line-oriented parser. 
And so I created a type called line buffer, which was a wrapper to stood string and had some functions for tokenizing and other things. And I had a function that I'll call read line. And read line read, read data from an input character stream and saved data into the line buffer. It would return to, it would return true every time it read a line and it was not at the end of the file. Otherwise, if there was some error, it would, it would throw an exception. And if it did get to the end of the file, it would return false. Very straightforward, function worked great. Then I had a function called parse line that would take the, the, the line buffer, uh, parse the tokens in the line buffer and create a syntax tree and do other things. Then I had a function called parse file. And in parse file, I dutifully instantiated my line buffer. And then I looped through the buffer, reading each line one at a time and parsing it. And I thought this was really smart and easy to read. And the first time I ran it with a, a, a file that I knew was full of valid data, I got no results. No, no syntax tree, no nothing. And so hopefully all of you out there are smarter than I was and you've seen the problem, which was this. I had inadvertently put a semicolon at the end of the while statement. And so I was actually looping through all of the input. And since the input was all valid input, no exceptions were thrown. And I got to the end of the line and had an empty buffer. And when I had an empty buffer and I parsed it, there was no syntax tree. So as I said, this cost me about an hour of my life. And at the end, I decided I needed to switch to a more readable font to make semicolons more apparent. Another type of error that you run into is implementation errors. And this is a case where you have high level algorithms or data structures or workflows, and they are logically correct, but lower level data structures are being used incorrectly. Those things which are used to implement the higher level constructs. Uh, they're responsible, they're somehow creating broken invariants or pre or post condition violations inside the higher level constructs. Then you have logic errors. And these are errors in the highest level algorithms or workflows in that they are logically flawed. They are either totally incorrect or you have the case of mostly correct operation, but your tests fail or the program fails on rare or unexpected corner cases. These are usually indicative of design flaws and can be quite expensive in terms of time and resources to fix. And finally, the last class of problems I'll discuss is configuration or build errors. And unfortunately, we sometimes find ourselves in a situation where incorrect or invalid binary components are included in a build. Uh, this could be the case where the incorrect version or an older version or a buggy version of a shared object or a DLL was shipped with a product, or perhaps uh, our make file is incorrectly written, not managing de dependencies correctly, and an invalid or, or uh, obsolete object file is actually linked into a build, was never rebuilt, and so the flaw, what flawed one is linked into the build. And this is, again, is evil because it results in successful builds that can appear to work and possibly pass tests enough uh, to, to be deployed. The worst case is that uh, the flaw is in the the object file that actually never got updated and you think you fixed it and you ship it again. But then of course that would indicate that you weren't doing a very good job in your testing. So the next thing you wanna do, having gone through all that, is try to repair the problem. And by repairing, I mean implementing an appropriate set of source code changes that are necessary and sufficient to resolve the problem. In other words, you wanna change the minimum set of things to fix the defect. And what is appropriate? Well, that varies from project to project. You demonstrate that the, that the product is repaired by passing tests, by, by passing existing tests with no regressions, and by passing the new tests that you've written that presumably exercise the section of code where the, where the defect originally occurred and you can definitively show that the defect is no longer occurring, at least in those sections. So try to minimize changes to the system 
keep them small and localized. And in this case, I'm thinking of static changes, minimize changes to source code. And, and minimize, if you can, changes to program state at runtime. Keep your footprint as small as possible, as small as necessary, but no smaller, so to speak. Verify your repairs against your tests, always, always, always. All of the new tests that you've created, all of your updated tests should all pass, and all other tests that previously passed should also test. Thou shall not introduce regressions. Finally, you're ready to deliver the fix. I think of delivery as being incorporating those changes that repair the problem into production code. And in doing so, I admonish you to practice good version control. Don't include fixes for more than one problem in a given commit. Don't include extraneous changes like adding new, new features in your fix commits. Include your new and updated test assets in your fix commits, especially if those assets are part of the source code base itself. Write commit statements that are clear and concise. And after you've done the merge, verify your tests again. Double check that all of your new and updated tests pass. Double check that all of your other tests have passed and you've introduced no regressions. After you've done that, create appropriate documentation for posterity. You want to record how the defect was noticed. And this is usually just the original problem report. The conditions under which the, content, the defect occurred. In other words, what was the context? What were the steps you needed to do to reproduce the defect? How do you build an analogous context? What are the tools and techniques you use to localize the defect? What is the defect's category? What is the underlying root cause of the defect? Did you prevent any latent defects from occurring by fixing this defect? Have you noticed or did you notice any possible latent defects that are not yet addressed? And you might notice these things while you're examining the code. Make sure you record the mistakes that were made and your recommendations for preventive actions in the future. And if your process includes this, make sure you conduct the required reviews so that you are distributing this knowledge uh, to other members of your team and your organization. So, in summary, practice defensive programming. Assume the worst case could happen at any time because it usually will. When you're programming, whether it's building a product or you're just implementing a fix in an older product, try to employ an appropriate iterative and incremental development process. Decide what needs to be achieved, what changes need to be made. Plan for how you're going to make those changes. Understand all of the invariants, the requirements, the context, and then design a solution. Implement your solution in small, discrete, and testable chunks. If the patch that you need to create is quite large, then it really will pay off if you can implement the totality of the patch in small sections such that you can test the operation of each section of that large patch. Make sure you write code to verify invariants, preconditions, and postconditions, and, and perform self-tests of complex components. Uh, maybe you can add these as part of the fix, as part of the fix that you've created, but also if your team is willing and your manager, your technical lead thinks it's okay, Add these at other points in the program because maybe they were missing, but having them is just a good idea anyway. Uh, and while you're doing that, consider reading about and employing some of the underlying principles of test-driven design. There are quite a lot of good ideas there, although I'm not sure I agree with everything there. Make sure that you implement your test assets, your test cases, your test data files in parallel with your solution. Iterate frequently over changing the solution, modifying the test if you need to, running the test to make sure that your solution so far is doing what you think it should be doing so far.
employ good configuration management practices, good version control everywhere, not just in your source code, but also in uh, the portions of your organization that do builds and deployment to customers. So reproduce the problem, absolutely vital. If you can't do it in the lab, figure out how to reproduce it in the field. Learn how to use the tools you have at your disposal. Again, use the warnings your compiler provides. Use static code analysis tools if they're available to you. Use interactive debuggers. That is a large portion of what I do debugging is with an interactive debugger. Use a time travel debugger if you're dealing with non-deterministic conditions and you happen to have one available to you. Uh, GDB can do it, I believe. Uh, RR, uh, part of the Mozilla project, can do it. Undo Software has their live recorder and UDB, which I'm told are, uh, are quite good products. Use sanitizers if it makes sense. If you're writing multi-threaded code, you should probably be using TSAN, the thread sanitizer, all the time anyway uh, before you make your releases. Use dynamic program analyzers. Sometimes val grind or call grind are lifesavers. And if need be, find and use external domain-specific diagnostic tools. When you're writing code, try to leave the code in a better state than you found it, even if it's only a little bit better. And as I mentioned, employ defensive programming and good process, even if it's only for your repairs. Make life easier to the extent you can for the next person that has to look at this code. When you're doing repairs, don't try to refactor. Repair only the stuff that needs to be repaired. Don't mix repairs and refactoring or improvements. Thoroughly document your changes and the justification for those changes. Leave breadcrumbs for the next person so they have an easier time figuring out what it was you try to do. Test your changes, make sure they work. If necessary, create new tests, update your existing test assets, run existing tests and verify no, no regressions have been introduced. And if I've said these last few things multiple times, it's because I mean them. They are very helpful and they are very serious. Test, 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 and then test some more. And at a minimum, your product will have higher quality than it did without running the tests, and you have lowered the probability of problems occurring in the future. And with that, We're done. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, any questions? Okay, so thank you, Bob, for this wonderful talk. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Marcus, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, uh, I can hear you, excellent. Um, do you wanna go forward or backward with the questions? Uh, let's start with the first question and work forward. Okay. The first question comes from Roy Bakken on slide 10. He asks, when a symptom is defined as observable, should there be a distinction between black box and white box ob observability? That's a very good question. I hadn't thought about that. In a sense, in a sense, certainly the symptoms that are observed by the person or entity that is reporting a defect are observing symptoms in a black box fashion. Presumably the customer or the tester uh, does not have insight into the contents of the system as it's executing. And from that perspective, you could consider that as being uh, black box observable behavior. Certainly, as a developer, uh, when you have compiled the product and you're attempting to reproduce the problem and you have reproduced it, you are seeing the same symptoms and perhaps you are even seeing symptoms uh, that are not reported externally, you could consider that to be a, uh, a white box observability. I think I'm perhaps using the term observable in the sense that observable is used uh, when describing the abstract, the C++ abstract machine. In other words, 
the machine exhibits behavior that can be observed by things that are outside of the process. Uh, hopefully that answers Roy's question. I hope so. Um, anyway, there's the after talk chat, so if there, there's some clarification or something, we, that's always a good place to go. Um, on slide 11, here's a second question. Maybe it makes sense if you go back so people have some context. Um, yeah. So slide 11, he asks, I wonder how do you consider robust self-healing architectures, which might hide, mask, eliminate symptoms, even in cases where requirements aren't adhered to? Well, they can certainly, uh, well, I guess I don't have any strong feeling about it because I've, I don't think I've ever worked on a system like that. I don't have any experience with it. So I can't really comment on how I feel about it. Um, I guess ad hoc, I might say that, uh, I might say that I would not look forward to working on such a system because it might make uh, tracking down the cause, locating the problem more difficult. But I, I don't know. I, as I said, I don't have any experience with that kind of system, so I can't really speak to it. Okay. Uh, then, without a specific slide, uh, Xavi Bonaventura asks, um, to, to ask me to forward a question that Titus Winters asked on uh, Twitter. Um, how do we convincingly argue the impact of outages that were avoided? How do we convincingly argue the impact of outages that were avoided? Yes. That's the question? Well, that presupposes that you can. So I'm, I'm assuming the question is about the impact rather than the outage. And there's an underlying assumption in the question that you can demonstrate that an outage could have occurred, but that outage was avoided. And the question is aimed more towards how do you argue or for or describe the impact that would have occurred if the outage itself had actually occurred. So assuming that the outage was in fact avoided, then how do you argue the impact? Well, I would look at it this way, uh, coming from having some experience running a company, and that is if the impact, uh, if the outage was avoided, there would be some financial cost. Uh, financial and otherwise, developer hours, dollars, uh, customer loyalty, brand, uh, brand equity, any of these things could have been damaged by an outage. And given the length of the outage, suppose that, you know, you say that you think that you avoided an outage, say that could have been 60 seconds long. Well, then the impact on those things was probably quite small. If, however, you avoided an outage that would have caused you, let's say, six hours of outage, as happened to Facebook recently, then I suspect the costs in all of those categories would have been quite a bit larger. And your accountants, your bean counters, could probably put a dollar value on those. And those are represent uh, a negative opportunity cost. That is, in other words, the cost, the financial cost your organization would have occurred if that impact, if that outage had occurred. And there are actually ways to value all those things. Now, of course, a less enlightened manager might say, well, sure, I might have lost that amount, but I didn't. So it's not really a loss. Well, no, it's not really a, it's not really a financial loss, but it could have been. And in a way, it actually represents possible technical debt or a way of valuing technical debt. So, yeah, I think I think the way you argue for it is you place a value on what it could have been and you go to management and say, look, you could have lost $10 million, but if you spend 50,000, we can fix X and we don't have to worry about this particular problem possibly happening again. Okay. 
that's let's argue for that the correlation is not as clear. For example, <coughs> you want to employ good version control and correlating good version control to we didn't have a six hour downtime. I think there's there's a lot of things in between that are not easily explainable or even easily provable, right? Maybe, right. like, how do you think about this kind of, like, I'm not even sure what word to put in, like how to call it. Right, well, I didn't say the process of valuation would be easy and you actually, that's a very, that's a very good example and, and one that's very complex. How do you put a dollar value on, uh, how do you put a dollar value on good version control practices, right? I think the way you value those is you say, having good, good version control practices helps us in these intangible areas. It prevents us from shipping products where the components are improperly matched and, and having the customers report defects and affecting our brand equity. Uh, that's not easy to value. It should be intuitively obvious, uh, and hopefully it is intuitively obvious to most managers, but I've also had experience with managers where it, the, the correlation between good practices and uh, uh, profit are not clear to that manager. So it, it's fuzzy. It's a very difficult problem. Uh, I don't have a good answer other than what I just gave you. Okay, thanks. Um, then uh, a question I, I that came through my head as I listened. In your career, have you debugged more data races or logic races? One is maybe both, but... Uh, well, If you mean it, it, do you mean deterministic versus non-deterministic problems? Uh, not quite. I mean, like having a actual like undefined behavior. You had didn't synchronize your code, so like the bits were like accessed in an unsynchronized fashion. Versus like you had proper locking and atomics, but the logic race, right? Like you adhere to the C++ abstract uh, machine, right. like what was asked of you, but your program still didn't do what you actually wanted. Right, I got you. Okay, so I would say that the number of data, using your definition, the number of data races I've ever debugged is probably zero. And most of my, all of my experience debugging race conditions has been with uh, what you just called logical race conditions. In other words, I thought I was using synchronization constructs uh, correctly, but I was not, thus leading to uh, race conditions. Uh, I will say that I once uh, debugged a race condition that cost me almost a month of my professional career to debug. It was quite challenging. And this was a problem that was actually a confluence of all of the things that you don't want to have happen. Everything that could be stacked against me was stacked against me in this. Uh, we had an, uh, an Oracle, a, a, uh, test production Oracle database. And it wasn't production, but it, it wasn't purely test. It was it was there to mimic production. So we weren't allowed as developers, we weren't allowed to touch it. We had to ask people to do stuff for us. Um, and we had a, a, a program which used an Oracle, Oracle facility called LogMiner. And you initiated a continuous LogMiner query, which just runs infinitely. And what LogMiner did is LogMiner took every transaction that the Oracle database uh, executed and it deconstructed that transaction into a small set of equivalent uh, inserts and deletes and updates. And then an equivalent set of inserts, updates, and uh, and deletes, and then committed those. And so it would turn a complex transaction into a series of very small, very simple SQL statements that, that uh, comprised the equivalent transaction. 
And then our product would lead that, read that series of SQL statements from Logminer, and then would use those statements to create equivalent state in a proprietary in-house database. Because we did not have a way to connect our in-house database to Oracle, this was the way we connected it. And after each such transaction uh, in our proprietary database, or after some number of transactions uh, at the end of the run, we knew what data was inserted in Oracle, and we knew what the state of the proprietary database was, and we would compare them. And that's the way we would make sure that the proprietary database held exactly the same data in exactly the same relationship as the Oracle database. So here, I've got something running in a context that I don't control. And the occurrence of the problem where there was a mismatch would occur very infrequently. And in fact, the program, this program run against the test database for many weeks at an ordinary load until it was first noticed. And the first couple times it occurred, we thought that it was problems with Oracle because we had seen similar behavior from Oracle, which was in fact problems. But my management says, no, we really need to fix this because we want to use your this product that's using LogMiner over on some important thing. We need to make sure that it doesn't have any bugs. So I used the technique of make the problem worse. So I asked the people that ran the test database, ratchet up the insert, ratchet up the number of transactions, you know, basically increase the number of transactions by a factor of 10 above what they were normally. So now I have this huge stream of data coming back, all of which was logged. And I might, even at that increased rate, run it for a day and a half and perhaps gather 20 or 30 gigabyte log files until I would detect the error. And maybe over the course of one or two days, only see the error once. And then having gone through, through cycle, several cycles of that, I realized it was a certain sequence of steps, of transaction steps that caused the problem to occur. Then I went back and looked to find, okay, for this given set of undo SQL steps, what was the original SQL statement that did this? And then I asked them to run transactions that were more like the, SQL, the original SQL statement so I could get equivalent SQL statements, undo SQL statements, to, to cause the bug to happen more often. Once I did that, then I had enough evidence that I could start looking in the source code to figure out where the problem might be. And that process of gathering enough data to just get to the step where I could make the problem worse took about two and a half weeks, as I recall. And it took another week or week and a half to actually pin down the race condition inside the code. And this was actually not multi-threaded code, of all things. Uh, the race condition was a subtle condition in um, the expectation of what invariants were. I had two function calls, F1 and F2. And as it turns out, F1, and they occurred in that order, F1 followed by F2. F1 had a very subtle dependency on the result of calling F2 that I had never thought about and never considered. And on this very rare circumstance, F2 did not... Uh, F2 did not set the state in such a way that F1 was expecting because it came after F1. And the fix was trivial. I switched two lines of code and the problem went away entirely. And this was just single threaded code, right? So uh, it pays to understand your invariants. But that whole process was about not quite, it was the month of August 2015, just about. It took me to solve that problem. And uh, uh, it, uh, I, I guess, I, I, I really learned the value of make the problem worse. And I, you know, I should have done that sooner, but it was just a difficult, difficult problem. And it's the worst problem I've ever had to solve, I think. Okay, thanks for sharing. Um, there's just, let me just check, but I think, Okay, yeah, there's not many more questions, go, so let's just do the last questions. Um, okay. That's um, another one by me for, on slide 37, but I don't think we have to jump there. It's not, the context is not so important. Um, you talked about uh, keeping changes small. Um, like once you have a fix, you want to keep the change as small as possible. But what if you assess 
the problem as being a systematic problem. Like you could do a small patch to fix this very one um, problem report you had, but you know future ones will come. Maybe you can't pinpoint or predict them right now, but your right. intuition or like you, it tells you this code is just not uh, it's systematically wrong for what it's trying to do. Right. So I think what you're describing in my mind, I would think of that as being a case of discovering, excuse me, discovering latent defects. You've become familiar with the code. You know you can fix the immediate problem, but you realize, wait a minute, there are some other problems that may not have been reported yet, and we should probably fix them too, right? Is that a fair? And so my response to that is, like everything in C++, it depends. Um, that's a case, and remember, so this is, I basically, it, it depends on your level of seniority, I would say. If you are a newcomer, relatively inexperienced, or a junior member of the team, then I would say, if that's the case, go to your technical lead, present them your case, and ask them what they want to do, right? Bring somebody else into the decision to help you decide what the right thing to do, and also, you know, mitigate any personal risks. On the other hand, if you are the most senior person or you are very senior and you are you know, entitled to make decisions like this on yourself, by yourself, then you know, it's a judgment call. Go ahead and make all, the fi make all the changes you need and include them in this fix or open a new ticket, describe exactly what you want, want to do and then make those changes that you're suggesting against that new ticket. And, you know, you can tell everybody, well, I was being very smart. I prevented these latent defects. And you can talk about that at, at your next review. OK, so you would would you say that what you just described would also apply to like. Architecture problems, for example, you, you, you read the code and you're like, OK, I could fix this one thing, but I see latent defects in the, the way the architecture is for this specific uh, situation. Yeah, I think uh, so. In that uh, in that specific question, I would say you know architecture is usually in a complex in any non-trivial system. Architecture is a big issue, and that's something that is better handled outside of the current ticket, outside of the current problem. Okay. In my experience. You know. uh, then there's one question by Roy Barkan again, slide 34. Do you think the committee should take aim at syntactically correct defects, compiler vendors, uh, question mark? I think no discard is an attempt to assist in such cases uh, and not clear if it's a good attempt. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I can't pretend to speak for what the committee should do or shouldn't do. In this particular on slide 34, this particular silly mistake I made, you know, you can make the argument that this is completely syntactically valid code, and you can also imagine cases where code that looks very much like this is actually semantically correct as well. It's a very common, perfectly valid technique to use a while loop or a for loop to skip over something until some some predicate fails and then begin processing it. So you you loop over something and you take no action while the loop variable is true and then you do something else. So in this particular case of this, you know, silly syntactical error, how is the compiler to know what I really thought? The compiler has no way of knowing whether I'm intentionally trying to skip lines or whether I've committed an error. So this is, however, something that, you know, a static analyzer might check. A static analyzer might look at this and say, well, wait a minute, he's got a semicolon and then it's immediately followed by a left curly brace. That might be a warning, right? But then again, you could also write the same statement without the curly braces. So I don't know. I, I suspect probably static analyzers can look at the context of the code and even do things like analyze the code style and say, well, wait a minute, there's an indentation here, so maybe Bob meant 
that the semicolon at the end of the while is an error. Or it might look at the indentation and say, well, parse line is not intended, so maybe Bob really did mean to skip stuff. You know, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for the question, I guess. It's not an easy question, so maybe there's no easy answer. Um, and then the last question, it's a simpler question by Yonki. Is there any, do you know about any sources, tutorials for learning about time travel debugging with GB, GDB? Um, no, I don't know of any about GDB. Um, I know, of course, you can go to the Undo website and learn about time travel debugging with UDB. I, th I think, I mean, asking about the tutorial, I, I could be wrong and I probably am wrong, but I seem to recall a talk being given at CPPCon in the early years about time travel debugging, although I don't know if it was with GDB or a proprietary product. I don't, I don't have an exact answer. My advice is ask Dr. Google and see what, uh, see what the doctor prescribes. One quick little note for the audience. Uh, I know or my understanding is that GDB time travel debugging only works for single threaded code, so might not be applicable to your problem. So if you want multi-threaded code, you need RR, undo, or like the Windows debugger, I think, has something like this too. Like not Visual Studio, but like, uh, like the Windows debugger is a separate product. Um, right. That's it. With that, it was a wonderful okay. talk. Thank you for for coming to our meetup and giving this talk. Thank you. We'll have an after talk chat in a minute. So see yes. you then. Well, yes. Thank you very much for having me. I hope uh, I hope all of you that attended got something useful out of it. And I will be in the after meetup chat in just a couple minutes. So thanks to thanks to all of you at MOOC C++, and uh, we'll see you in a few minutes.